Thank you very much. I do know that everybody's been looking forward to this today and we have a huge amount of things to get through. Okay. Um, so thank you for being with us. No problem, um, it's a pleasure. In the past, you've written comedy, you've written drama, screenplays for films, TV series. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I'm sure one or two of us have heard of that. Um, pretty varied. You didn't spend much of your life wanting to be a train driver? No, no, no. No? I, I wanted to be a writer from about the age of about nine. Ten. Really? Yeah, yeah. And, and what were your early forays into writing? I mean, I just, I just liked doing it and I enjoyed doing it and then... Um, I studied English at university and then I think the first thing that was ever sort of out there was uh, a short story on WM, the radio station in Birmingham. Um, You're very proud of Birmingham. I am very proud of Birmingham. Born actually. and bred here? Yeah, I was actually born and lived for about six months, my first six months in a, a little village in Wiltshire because my dad was a blacksmith <clears throat> and the whole family were from Birmingham originally. And I was the, the youngest of seven kids. And when I was born and the blacksmith shop no longer made any money, they moved back to Birmingham and my dad worked in a car factory for his life. So, I mean, from six months, I lived in Birmingham. Now, obviously, Birmingham has had a huge influence on your life. Yes. And we'll come on to that a little bit later. Did you start researching the history of the city or your personal uh, history? I, I, grew, I grew up with stories from my mum and dad about um, growing up in Small Heath, and my mom, when she was eight or nine years old, was a bookies runner because they used kids to take bets. So she would be walking down small heath uh, roads with a basket of washing and people would wrap their steak, a couple of coins in a piece of paper that had the name of the horse and their code name on it and they would drop it in and she'd walk down to the bookies and then she'd lay the washing basket on the desk of Tucker Wright, the bookie, and he'd take all the cash. And my dad's uncles were the Sheldons, who were also known as the Peaky Blinders. In spite of what you may read in history books, they were still there in the 20s. Really? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And then, of course, there were uh, other gangs after that, the Brummagems. And Brummagem the boys, yeah. Brummagem yeah. boys, yeah. and then the Birmingham gang. Yeah, I mean, I, I, for some reason, I think Birmingham has always had a, a, a gang right up to this present day gang culture but us you know a lot of cities do have that um but, but the stories i heard you know when my parents were kids they were seeing these people who were gangsters and so they were they mythologized those people you know when, and they'd be outside the pub and the door opens and you smell the cigarettes and you smell the beer and you see the men the men used to be immaculately dressed so that they really sort of looked up to these people and then when they told me the stories it was a double mythology and when we made the series I decided to keep it um, keep the mythology the way that Americans take um, you know cowboys are basically 19th century agricultural laborers and Americans have turned it into the western they've, they've used it and, and made the mythology and, and that's what I wanted to do with the stories I'd heard and, and our sort of collective history. Well, obviously, the, the Piggy Blinders came quite a long way into your career. As I say, it started off in a very varied fashion. Uh, talk us through what happened after you left university for the last time. You walked out and said, what shall I do now? And worked in a shoe shop. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Um, and a clothes shop and um, ended up working in an advertising agency, a radio advertising agency in Birmingham. And then um, I enjoyed that. Writing radio is a, is a really good discipline for you get exactly 30 seconds to, to say what you've got to say, and you have not 30 and a half, exactly 30. So you start to learn economy. Um, and then I worked in radio and then started doing comedy, which again is a great way to learn to write. Anybody who's ever told a joke in a pub knows that if you get one word wrong or you hesitate or you stumble, it doesn't work. So comedy really does enforce discipline. You've still got to work with somebody who's got the timing and the persona. Mm. And of course, you work with Jasper Carrot a lot. Yeah. Apart from him, some people did have to. <laughs> yeah. no, no, he's really good. He was great. Yeah. So that was a programme called The Detectives. Yes. So how did your writing into comedy come about? As you say, you need to be very structured about it. But you've got to be funny as well. Yeah, I mean, comedy is really, really difficult, which is why I stopped doing it, you know, because you have to, when we were working with Jasper, I worked with other stand-ups where you'd spend the, the afternoon coming up with new stuff and then in the evening, you'd go in front of a live audience and do it, 
um, in preparation for the TV series. So things that worked survived, things that didn't work didn't survive. But it's such a strenuous thing because you've got to make the audience make that noise. You've got to make them laugh. But at the same time as I was doing that, I was also writing I wrote a, a couple of novels, but also wrote uh, a screenplay for a film which got made. So then that completely changed what I was doing. So I started to write movies after that. I noticed from all the work that you've done that quite often these projects overlap and that must yes. be very difficult to be trying to hit a deadline with one project and then also to think creatively on another one. I think it helps. I think if you're doing various things at the same time, it's almost like each one is a relief from the other one, especially if they're very different. If you're getting deeply into, into one topic and then you have to break off, do something else, and then you go back to the first thing and you just sort of relay them. I think it really helps to, to give you energy for each one. And when you're writing, do you do that from home? Yeah. Because you have to be very disciplined to do that too. You do, uh, unless, you enjoy, unless you enjoy it, which I do. And I try, I try not, it doesn't always work, but I try to pick projects that I want to do. And I find that once you're into it, when you really get into it, you can't stop. You know, I've, I've had times when I've shaved twice. I've had two. Sh I've had a shower and then realised I've already had a shower because I've forgotten. Because of, you get so deeply into whatever it is that you're doing that sort of the reality sort of disappears and you're and you're just constantly thinking about it. But that is is what drives you to the keyboard and then you, then you get it out and you get it done. Now you had. A minor success with a program called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Um, I mean, this was huge. It was rocket size. And this was with Mike Whitehill and David, David Briggs. Briggs. Were yeah. they friends of yours? Yeah, or, or we all worked colleagues? together at Capital, Capital Radio. Um, and then Mike Whitehill and I started writing comedy, but we were in a place called Celador where you could, um, we were writing comedy on sort of the first floor and on the second floor was people making game shows. So if you had an idea, you just walked up the stairs and, says, and said, what about this? And we had a couple of you know, moderate successes with things on ITV, Philip Schofield and things, and they were fine. And then we did this other, this one, um, which was the hardest one to sell um, because people said quiz shows are dead and you know, no one does quiz shows anymore. Um, and it took two years, I think everybody turned it down. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, everybody. And like J.K. Rowling. They're yeah, all slapping yeah. themselves now. Yeah, well, and, and then it, it was Paul Smith who ran Celador who realised the only way to get someone to understand how it would work was to use real money. And so I think it was David Liderman, and he went and sat with David Liderman, and he said, I will, I will play this for your money. You're going to give me your money, and you're going to win it back. Right. And so they played it for real cash. And, and suddenly you had the you sort of get adrenaline, the, yeah. and then and then that's when it, it sold to ITV, and then they, for, to be fair to them, they really went for it, and they made it uh, consecutive nights, which again was something brand new. But surely at that point you could pretty much have uh, put your feet up and gone to live in Spain and said, "That's it, I'm done." Uh, yeah, but the, the thing I think the thing with writing is you want to. It's got to be something you want to do. You know, if if it was a if it was if it was work, I wouldn't do it. So, of course, after that, you diversified. You made a, a switch to film screenwriting. This was uh, from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire to Gypsy Woman. And this is way back in 2001, so we're still quite a long way back. Mm. How, did you, how did you make that di uh, change in direction? Well, before that, I'd written novels, which had, you know, they, hadn't, they hadn't set the world on fire. They'd been published by Penguin, and they were okay. And then I was, uh, started to write another novel and decided that it would be better as a screenplay and that became Dirty Pretty Things and that's, that's the one that really changed things and made it made the, the, the move into, into film um, possible because it, it got well received and so therefore um, you know I started to get offered commissions which was good. Well by that stage uh, you'd made a fair bit out of Millionaire, and that, of course, was a very popular programme. As you say, it was broadcast on sequential nights. Uh, Dirty Pretty Things, in 2002, you got the Edgar Award for Best Motion Picture Screenplay, the London Film Critics Circle Award for British Screenwriter of the Year, 
do you remember these, uh, nominated for an Academy Award for Writing Original Screenplay and also the BAFTA Award for Best Original Screenplay. You must have been amazingly proud, but when you say that you've got to have a desire to write and you've already reached those goals, what drives you on after that? Um, it, it is wanting to... It, it, I, I'm sure everybody's in a different discipline has a different equivalent to this. But for me as a writer, an idea comes into your head or somebody says something or you come across a true story or whatever and you just really think that could really be a great story to tell. And if you enjoy the process of doing it, you, you just carry on doing it. And also, I mean, obviously you want to keep going and you don't want to... I don't know what I would do if I didn't write. There were two separate protocols there. There's the creativity and then obviously there's the discipline of writing. How difficult is it to balance the two? Because obviously dirty, pretty things followed by Eastern promises, very different. Yeah, and it, I think it's good to, to make sure that everything you do, that things that follow on are, are different to each other. But again, it's not it's not as if I sort of say, I wake up in the morning and think, oh, I've got, to, I've got to go and do this, so I'm really disciplined. I'm going to do it because I, I want to do it. Well, you say you want to do it, but then you also keep diversifying because in 2013, you ended up directing. This time it was Hummingbird, uh, 2013 with Jason Statham and then a year later Locke with uh, Tom Hardy. How did you find that experience? Uh, directing is really is proper work. It's hard work. Is it? It's horrible. It's horrible. Um, I mean physically very hard um, but it's sort of addictive as well strangely. Um, so I'd, uh, after I'd done Locke with Jason, Jason fantastic to work with so it wasn't anything to do with that. It was just this is such hard work why would I do it and then I found myself doing another one within about a year and a half with, with Tom. And I mean, that was a great experience and working with him. I've worked with him a lot since. So um, I think that sometimes you come across a project or you, you start a project and the process of, I mean, as well as doing the things that I want to do, I've also done quite a bit of credited and uncredited work on Hollywood films that are you know, big budget, and there you're just part of a machine. They they ask you to do the draft, you do the draft, it then gets passed on, someone else does one, someone else does one. So it's a, I mean, the money's good, but it's a, it's a real industry. Um, but certain things come along where you think, I don't want to hand this over to a director, I want to do it myself, and then, then you regret it, and then you've got no choice, and then you carry on. <laughs> Would you say that the responsibility as a director is the greatest, more so than uh, when you're a producer. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. I mean, it, it becomes very much your your film. But I don't mind that. I mean, I don't mind reviews or you know people either like it or they don't like it. You just have to accept it. It's the getting up very early in the morning that I don't. Very unpleasant. <laughs> now we we have touched on it before, but of course, most recently you've become very well known for Peaky Blinders, set here in Birmingham and based on a true story. It's been described as dark and mesmerising, certainly that. And in fact, I can say that with five children, it's the only thing I've ever said. I'm not sure you want to watch that. <laughs> it's a bit graphic. <laughs> certainly the first series was really quite graphically violent. What drove you to all of this? You say that it was looking back at family mm. history that mm. made you want to explore, but there is so much there. The, the jewellery, the tattoos, the hats, obviously, mm. the hats, peaky mm. blinders, the way they looked. And I mean, that particular style of, you know, the very short hair at the side and, and longer on the top, was that something which was popular in like 2013 or was it something that was popular at the time and you made popular again. I mean, the, the haircut, the, the buzz cut that has become popular was um, when soldiers went to war uh, to stop lice so that the, the hair would be shaved so that the back of the neck, which is where the lice would be when you're in the trenches, was gone so that they would cut the hair all the way around. And when we first did it and Killian and, and um, Paul and everybody had to have the haircut, it was like freakish. They were really, it, it was really a weird thing to do, to have your hair cut like that. And they, as people, you know, after they'd finished shooting, would go to the hotel and everybody would stare at them. But now it's really common. And it caught on. I yeah. mean, it caught on as a, as a, a, yeah. you know, a fashion look. Yeah. It was a, quite extraordinary. As I say, from the very first moment that I, I caught it on the television, mm. um, it is something that absolutely gripped. So would you say this has been your, your biggest opus so far? I think, I think so. I mean, I'm most proud of it. Um, 
it, 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 because it's personal and it's to do with you know stories from the family and things. Um, and the way it's caught on, I didn't think it would catch on, even in the UK, in the way it did. But it's all over the world. And, and well, it's on Netflix now. Yeah, and it, but it's it's everywhere. I mean, it's in Turkey, in South America, and Russia, and everywhere. Any of the people who are involved in it go. That's the first thing that people talk about. And it's it's become, you know, um, I had a bizarre couple of hours with Snoop Dogg, <laughs> who is a fan, and he. He came to London and, and his agent phoned my and said, you know, he'd like to meet. And we spent three hours of him talking about how it reminded him of how he got into gang culture. And that in South Central and in parts of New York, it's really popular with people. You know, it's like, how did this Birmingham in the 20s have this effect? And it's nothing, you know, I think with everything that you do, it's a, a lot of it is, it really is luck and the time, the timing of it. You know, you just get luck that it just happens to strike a chord at the right time. Um, and that's what this seems to have done. And, you know, I, I've got no idea why it has done that, but it's become really popular with... Now, I, I can understand that there was a degree of family history here that you wanted to explore and that it was a project that was very close to your heart. But overall, it doesn't really paint Birmingham in a very good light. But the strange thing is, people seem to love it. You know, they, they, they like people to go to the the real garrison is a not well, it's not even a pub anymore. It's a it's a sort of ruin, it's derelict. But people still go and take pictures of it. You know, and I think that there is a sort of swagger about it and a and a glamour about it that people do respond to. So. I agree, but because I think because it's heightened and, it, and it's a bit removed from reality, then I think people accept it. You, know. you mentioned that it took quite a long time to sell the concept of who wants to be a millionaire. How long did it take to sell the concept of Peaky Blinders and to get funding for it? Well, I wanted to do it years ago, like about 20 years ago, I think. And I took it to Channel 4 at least 20 years ago. And they were, they, were, they were interested, but it never happened. I'm really glad it didn't, because we didn't have the technology that we have, the, the, the work, you know, all the things that you see and the effects and, um, and the style of shooting wouldn't have been possible then. So then I started doing films and I forgot all about it. And then just at the very beginning of when television became not the, the poor relation of film, you know, just when it was, the balance was starting to shift, um, I was asked if I had any television ideas. And I, literally in the bottom drawer I had not anything that ever appeared in this series, but just some thoughts about it. And um, so I went to see the BBC, which, I mean, God bless the BBC, because they tend to go, yeah, OK, fine, come back when it's done. You know, and um, <laughs> they don't give you any of the stuff you get from stu American studios. They'd, they just leave you alone. And they said, just do it. So then I did two scripts, and they liked it, and they commissioned it. So it wasn't a hard sell by that time, but it did take a long time. The gestation of it was, you know, 20 odd years, because I'd always wanted to tell that story. Now, as it happened, you got quite a bit of funding from Screen Yorkshire. Mm. A bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, I don't know why that has become part of the thing, but uh, we got some, um, you know, there was a time when people were encouraging people to shoot in their district and we got so you had to shoot some of Peaky Blinders up in Yorkshire? Well, no, we did it in Yorkshire because it still had the locations that oh, we wanted. Really? And same as Liverpool and Manchester, where Birmingham, it's, I mean, this is changing now, but Birmingham didn't have the sort of housing stock left. It does in certain places, but Liverpool had Stanley Dock, which was great, which is where the original garrison was. Uh, and it had uh, what became Watery Lane, which is the street where Ringo Starr was born and so that street had survived and so we shot there um so no i mean we, i mean the incentive to go to to leeds wasn't really that we were given tons we weren't given lots of money did you spend a lot of time on location at some in the at the beginning yeah um but i think if if i'm not directing i try not to hang around because the director's got to get on with it um, so when you when you see the finished product i mean you just marveled at that on the big screen uh, it just looks great. I mean, we've been really lucky with great directors and particularly great cinematographers. Um, and we're just shooting Series 5 now. I was up there the other day. And the stuff from Series 5 is the best yet. It's just beautiful. It's partly to do with the fact that technology has moved on so you can 
make stuff look great. And, and I think something that's under under recognised about television. And I mean, I now love television. I love doing television because you get freedom, you get control of what what gets made. You don't have a hundred studio executives going through everything. But I think part of the TV revolution is that now people have screens at home where it's worth the programme maker making the effort to make it look beautiful because you can tell. I mean, if you think back, 25 years of people watching telly on these sort of bulbous things, there would be no point making it look like that because nobody would be able to see it. Whereas as the screen technology has improved, that has allowed cinematographers and filmmakers to go, I, I want to do that, I want to make that. And I think now that it's the, the, the transition is complete with pretty much everybody, in fact everybody, that no longer is it considered to be an inferior art form, television. You say it was actually quite a good thing that you couldn't make Peaky Blinders when you wanted yeah. to because technology yeah. obviously advanced yeah. in the intervening period. Which specific bits have changed? Because obviously it looks fantastic on the screen now. What yeah. couldn't you have done well, 20 years ago? Yeah, I mean, you know, I was around film sets quite a while. And, and the, the, the fact that you've got the Alexa and the red camera, you know, cameras that you can shoot in, in light, normal light. You know, you don't, they, they, we used to have these great brutes and these massive lights and, and the lighting set up. I mean, you still, when you're making a film, you still have to wait an hour and a half while they set up the lights. But... I think with something like um, with Peaky, you know, when you're on the set, you're no longer walking around, dodging around lights and kicking lights. It, it's the camera technology is so good now, and obviously it's all to do with digital. But um, you know, you can make something that looks beautiful on a budget, and also you, the technology has just improved everything. Obviously, technology is something that's of a huge interest yeah. to uh, the audience here tonight. We've got a couple of questions. And remember, you've got the app available if you want to ask any. Um, so when writing for television, are you aware of a technical, uh, the technical budget restraints? Yes. Um, especially if you work in... I mean, I've, 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 I've written something for uh, Apple, which is being shot at the moment, where the budget is ten times what it is for, for Peaky Blinders. However, with the, B the, the way that BBC works, you have very, very creative people who deal with the problem of, you know, in the script you say the thing, the, the pub explodes and, and horses run away and, and there's a boat on the canal and, and they find creative ways of getting it. So sometimes I think having a smaller budget leads to creative solutions. Having the bigger budget means you just throw money at it, which is very Hollywood thing to do and, and it doesn't necessarily benefit the end result so absolutely I mean you have to cut your cloth you know and, and you have to be realistic about what you can achieve but you have to have the budget in your mind. Yeah. Do you get involved at all with the casting? Yes yeah yeah I mean with, with Peaky we're lucky it's not like this with everything but with Peaky we pretty much get our first choice every time because like, people want when I mean, the incoming we get from people who want to be in it is amazing but we, we try not to make it a sort of spot the celebrity cast. Your main character Thomas Shelby, yeah. hypnotically beautiful man, um, worth watching whatever he's doing <laughs> um, but also in Piggy Blinders you created a steam ceiling character in Alfie Solomons played by Tom Hardy. Yes. Now somebody here would like to know that are there any plans for a spin-off series? Well, he's dead at the oh. moment. Um, <laughs> but, it's a bit of a blow. But watch this, watch this, watch this. Space. I mean, it, he's a character that has really uh, caught people's imagination. And, um, you know, when people do respond like that, you want to respond back. So we'll see. Okay. We'll wait and find out. Uh, so far, four seasons. But... We know there's a fifth in the pipeline, and more to come after that? Yeah, there's going to be five, six, and seven, and I'm going to take it up to the start of the Second World War, and then we will see. And to what degree, when you get that far, is it going to reflect Birmingham's true history, that of other gangs coming along? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to not just reflect gang history, but the history of the country, and trying to make it the story of a family, but also story a, a sort of a working class story of people between the wars what happened and how history affected them and how they affected history 
So I am introducing and all and have from the beginning introduced real characters like Churchill, so that you do see you see their uh, tribulations against the backdrop of stuff that really happened. So five, six, and seven. Are they going to be commissioned by the BBC? Yes. But Peaky Blind is also now being seen on Netflix. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier, the, not the conflict, the, the changes coming about in film mm. as you put more technology mm. um, and finesse onto television programmes. Mm. Can, you, can you see a future where things are much more episodic because people mm. don't really want to wait a, a week or, or necessarily to sit down for a couple of hours? Well, I think it may be going back in the other direction a bit in, in that people definitely watch television differently now. I mean, there's no question that it will ever go back completely to people all sitting down at the same time. However, for example, with Apple, you know, the discussion is the power of everybody seeing the same thing at the same time can't be underestimated so that next day they go to work and talk about it. If everybody's watching it at a different time, it's different. So I think you can have your cake and eat it where you start something by giving it a scheduled slot. You know, broadcast television is far from, far from dead. You know, it, it's, I don't think that people, you know, believe radio was dead, they believe cinema was dead. I think that broadcast television, and particularly, I'm a very, very loyal to the BBC because I think in all the world, they should be swaggering. They're, you know, they've got the brand that they should be marketing all over the world. Never mind Netflix and Apple and everyone else. The, the BBC should be the brand that, it's the only broadcast platform that had a good Second World War. You know what I mean? They've got history. They've got something. And, and I think, I'm, I mean, I'm committed. I'm doing um, a series of five Dickens novels adaptations for the BBC. It will be done with the BBC ethos of They Leave You Alone, but with money from an American partner. And I think that's the perfect marriage, is where you get the budget is, is, is swollen by that. But you do, you do it according to the BBC way of doing things. So whatever ideas you have, you're always going to take them to the it BBC? Depends what, I mean, it depends what they are. I mean, there's also, you know, if you're doing a, a big American saga, you're going to go to an American broadcaster first because it's not the BBC's territory. But if it's something that is British uh, or international, then that definitely, yeah. Um, what if Netflix or Amazon or Apple came to you with a, a direct commission? How would you feel about that? Well, I mean, that's happened and I've done it. I mean, that, that's the thing I'm doing with Apple. And, you know, you have to not limit yourself and you have to do what you find creatively interesting um, because it is a big world out there. And I'm still writing films and I've written the, I've written the films being shot for Netflix. Netflix are making features as well. Um, so, you know, everything's getting blurred and everything's crossing over. Well, of course, uh, one of your biggest pro uh, projects at the moment is a studio not so very far away from here. Absolutely. Um, tell us a bit about that. Um, uh, two and a half, three years ago, um, just when Peaky was taken out, I, I just felt that Birmingham, there was a hole in the middle of the country where of production, there was nothing. There wasn't a lot being produced here and there wasn't a big studio facility. At the same time, I was trying to make a film called Allied and it was quite a big budget and we couldn't find a studio. We ended up shooting it in the um, Gillette factory in on the West Wood, on the A4. Um, next door to Sky. Next door to Sky, yeah. yeah. And it was fine, but it just made me realise that there's a chronic shortage of studio space. Lots of people want to come to Britain because of the tax break, because of the crews and because of the actors. Um, and I just thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to build something in Birmingham? Now, fortunately, uh, again, it was a lucky coincidence that at the time there was a sort of um, a, a growing urgency to do something in preparation for HS2. Um, because when HS2 comes, we're gonna, this is going to be 38 minutes from Houston. You know, and that puts it in zone five of the underground um, and so you know and, and so it's probably quicker it will be quicker to get there from here to get to Euston from here than it would be from Watford so that's going to change things a lot and so that wasn't I didn't do what I'm doing because I knew that I found that out as we're going along sort of thing and it's been great that the the current mayor of 
of the West Midlands, um, Andy Street, was at the time. He, he wasn't mayor yet, but he was very committed to the to the region, and he uh, was a big supporter. Birmingham City Council liked the idea of, of having a studio, and it sort of developed organically, where to the point where now the plan is six sound purpose-built sound studios. One of them for bro uh, equipped with a shiny floor for, for TV broadcast um, with a halo area around it of post-production, animation, um, and all the things that go with the studio, but also I want it to be a destination where there are there's going to be residential, but there's going to be um, pubs and bars and restaurants and theatres and cinema. So it's almost like saying, let's create Soho. You know, let's let's make a new one. Um, and obviously it will never be Soho, but it will be something different. And I, I want it to be um, the whole place to be about moving image. So the design, we've got Gensler doing the design, who are the best in the world, in my opinion. They design Pixar studios, which are amazing. So I want the, the halo area, which is public access, to be very plain walls, but with loads of projection, so that you feel as if you're walking into a film or a TV show, or whatever, and so that it's adaptable, so that whatever's been shot in the studio, you can see reflected in the area around it. I want to build the Dickens set there, um, so that we can shoot not just Dickens, but other things, period dramas in the 20s and 30s, because we've had such a problem finding them, um, and have that available to the public when you're not shooting. So the whole thing is going to be about the, about media. Um, and the studio itself, um, with, I'm working with BAFTA, who have a sustainability um, department, of trying to make it the greenest studio. So the roofs will be bird sanctuaries with grass and, and things. And we will be using no, uh, no plastic bowls. It will be electric vehicles. And just trying to make the whole thing, let's start again. How would you make a studio now, right now? Because, you know, a, a lot of studios develop because they're already there. You know, I love Ealing more than anything. Mm -hmm. Ealing's beautiful. And, the, you know, their issue is that they can't spread and they can't expand. So that's what I want to do is to say to everybody involved, how would you do this in a perfect world? You know, you've got all the space you want, you've got what you want, you've got the technology you want. Um, and that's what we are planning planning to do. Obviously a, a green um, project, but also one that's going to incorporate a lot of the latest technology. Yes. Uh, we've got a question about um, 8K cameras coming to play I don't know in Japan, about. especially for the Olympics. You don't know about those. <laughs> that's good because nor do I. Um, <laughs> but would you be looking to make a continuous investment in technology going forward? Technology, being cutting edge technology is absolutely what it's all about. We've got Birmingham City University and University of Birmingham and Coventry and other educational institutions who we want to have campuses on in on our lot um, because we want this to be about absolutely doing things in a new way, absolutely cut it. And it's already here. I mean, this is an area where there's a lot of computer animation stuff going on. It just happened around that sort of donut area and around Coventry. Um, so we want all of that. I'm, I'm inviting Imaginarium to come up and have some space there. Um, I'll have meetings with Technicolor and all, uh, lots of different companies who I want to plant their flag with us and absolutely to be able to say that if you want to try something different, this is where you would do. Um, as well as having the oldest form of drama, which would be live theatre as well. Where exactly are these uh, new studios going to be located? Um, here. Here? <laughs> Not here, but no, I mean in, in this area. Oh, really? Yeah. So close to the NEC? Yes. Now, I'm only being slightly coy because it hasn't been announced yet, but yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, you've already recognised the fact that the HS2 is going to make a, a big difference in terms yeah. of travel times from London and therefore the potential to move such a huge business centre out of the, mm. uh, the capital. You must have been very disappointed then when Channel 4 opted for Leeds over Birmingham. No, I mean, I, I, did some, I did some work on that and, and really wanted Channel 4 to come because I thought it was an indicator or a signifier of, of what could come in the future. 
However, having said that, I mean, good, well done to Leeds and good luck to them because Leeds is a beautiful city and there's a lot of production going on there and it was probably the right choice. But as far as Birmingham, filmmaking, television making and the future of Birmingham as a media centre, um, I think we can move on comfortably. The vision that you've portrayed for this new studio, the Mercian Studio, um, as green electric cars, no plastics, I mean these are all buzzwords for today. Um, you're looking to film your next series of Dickens um, adaptations. Probably pick, picking up from the, probably the second one, yeah. yeah. And what, what sort of other content would you look at uh, being made there? I, I, I want to, I mean, on signature of the deal, I'm, I'm going to be in, um, I've, I'm in Los Angeles a lot, so I've already had meetings with physical production people at Paramount and Netflix. What I want to do is say to people, here is an opportunity for you to, to have uh, space in the UK, close to London, but also we're going to be training people here so that they, they will have crew nearby. Um, and just offer it as an opportunity, especially if someone has a big franchise that is two and a half years, two years away from production. We can say to them, what do you want? You know, we can build it for you. What facilities would you incorporate that you don't naturally find at other studios? I, know, I, mean, I think it would be exactly what you would expect from a studio. We need all of the stuff that, would, that is there at Pinewood, Shepparton, Leaves, all do a fantastic job. That's why people keep coming back and that's why they're busy. That's why they're booked, because they do such a great job. You know, we're not reinventing the wheel in, in that sense, but um, if nothing else, we're providing space. You know, this is what people want. They want space and we're going to do it as efficiently and as well as anybody else. But as well as that, there are going to be these additional attractions that I hope, you know, often it's talent that makes a decision about where something's shot, incredibly. Um, and so... I want this to be a place where you walk through the perimeter and you feel you're in a very creative, artistic environment. Now you say it's not all been announced yet, uh, signatures to be put on dotted lines, but when do you see it all up and running? I'm hoping that we will have, um, by January the 1st we should have. Really? Hopefully. And, and then the studio um, completed by? Well that would depend on the process, but um, I've, I've just had a meeting with Soli Hall two days ago, and that's what I'm saying about the people, the authorities are very keen for this to happen. So there are procedures that have to be gone through um, quite rightly, and those procedures will be gone through, but I don't imagine that it will be a long drawn out process. Now we have a question uh, from the floor, which has just been removed. Thank you oh. for that. Um, <laughs> we do have a question about where the funding is coming from for this studio complex. Yes, I mean the initial funding will come from people like myself. Um, so myself and others will be funding the initial stages, which is the getting the plans and the design out there. We anticipate that there will be a number of people who would be willing to finance something in this area of this kind that also involves residential and F and B as they call it. F and B. Food and beverage. Food and beverage. I'm learning all these phrases about property. <laughs> I keep seeing a technical question come up and then somebody removes it. And I can't oh no no! What the wording is uh, immer something about immersive content. Um, oh, have you created any VR or immersive content? Any plans to, uh, and what about the format? Yes, the the idea for the studio is to have um, is to have so that you are walking into an environment that is, as well as projection, you are going to be walking into play into virtual reality environments as well, because the whole idea is that in this place reality can be circumvented. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what we want this place to be entirely. Uh, another question from the floor. How do you think artificial intelligence will impact on storytelling? Well, I hope they never invent a robot that can write scripts, um, but maybe they will. Um, I, don't, I, I, I keep hearing very intelligent people saying that artificial intelligence is, is dangerous. I don't know enough about it to know whether that's true or not, but when you hear lots of people saying that and saying you don't know what you're getting into, it, is, it can be worrying, I mean, but 
you know, what is human, what is creativity, maybe people who are in the creative field need to, to stop being so precious and understand that maybe a machine can do it. You know, it can play chess, why can't it write? Maybe. I don't necessarily think that artificial intelligence is up to that kind of creativity, but that's just you never a know. subjective idea. Um, there's another question from the floor. Best film or show that you ever made or wrote? Uh, Peaky, I think, um, and Dirty Pretty Things. And in terms of simplicity of idea and just... It, it's always nice to, to have an idea that it's then simply executed. It's like, you no, know, simple food can be the best. And I think Who Wants to Be a Millionaire was just like a very simple thing that by a series of accidents became exactly what it needed to be you know just by trial and error and we kept doing stuff and made some mistakes and then got it right i know from having spoken to you today that peaky blinders is obviously very very close to your heart uh to the extent that actually it's uh, extended out into clothing yes yeah um a lot of people were wearing the clothes and i was very aware that a lot of things were being made unlicensed by us um, and pubs and bars opening and uh, events happening and which at first is fine you think That's, you know it's great that people are really picking up on it but then a couple of things happen and, and some people are disappointed at the experience they have and you think well maybe we should we should you know take responsibility for this and start doing our own thing. So I started on a very small scale. Someone approached me and said, have you thought about a clothing thing? And they were a clothing designer and, and manufacturer. So I said, yeah, we'll do it. And, and so they make uh, clothes. But the, what's happened since Series 4, which Series 4 had a big effect because it, it was successful, more successful than we thought it would be. And the, the distributors end them all are now involved in what will be next year a bigger, a, a much bigger and more visible merchandising campaign, which will be clothes and beer and gin and all sorts of stuff. Because if you can, why not? But the Garrison Tailors at the moment are offering um, bespoke, handmade, yes. individual jackets. I yeah. mean, they're not cheap, but they're certainly quality. Well, I think that the thing, well, I said when we first started doing it, and I, I'm not particularly hands-on because I don't know a lot about design and clothing and all of that, as you can probably tell. Um, but the, the what I wanted to do was to make it British made and often apparently I found out in clothing British made actually means some bits of it are in Britain and then they send it off to Portugal to be stitched or somewhere else to be stitched. And I suggested that we stick to our guns and make it entirely British. So. The suits are active. There's a sort of four tailors in Edinburgh who are the only ones left who are of a certain age and who are now frantically working um, because that's the only way we can get them made actually in Britain. So that, that's probably why they're a bit expensive. Now. Well, there's the suits, there's the, the peaky hats. hats, of course. Yeah. Um, very nice scarves. You were wearing one earlier. I don't oh, know what you've done with it. It's here. Are you still there? There you go. Uh, it was around your neck when you came in. Um, and you've got a new project on, on that as well, at the Taylors? Oh, um, yes. Uh, the, the David Beckham company uh, are going to start making peaky hats. David Beckham company is starting to make peaky hats? Yes. Without the razor blades, one would hope. Without the razor blades, yeah. You bring your own razor blades, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, peaky has been used as a theme for... Fancy dress parties? Weddings, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's great. I mean, I love the fact that people are really getting into it and wearing the clothes and uh, and there are events that are very peaky blind. Does it, it, you know, what, what can you say? I got sent a photo from Sweden where a Swedish football team were playing, the supporters of the team, they were going to the away game and they, they all pose outside the train station before they go on. And they're all dressed as peakies. And there's three Alfie Solomons standing there really? posing for the thing. <laughs> so popular it really has caught people's imagination uh, a comment from the floor rather than a question saying uh, with all the tech in the world it still comes down to great storytelling and that's what you do you bring us absolutely great stories 
But what happens after Peaky's? Uh, I mean, I'll still carry on doing other stuff. Uh, we may do a film, um, but uh, you know, uh, there are lots of. Uh, I'm really loving doing Dickens, so that will probably take me through the next ten years. Um, but yeah, I'm, but on that point of great stories, the, the importance of the technology cannot be underestimated. The fact that if, if that if Peaky was made, no matter even if it was exactly the same script and the same actors, without being able to look like that, it wouldn't have the authority that it's got because people need to be sort of almost intimidated by how it looks. And I think that's what comes from great cinematographers, brilliant equipment, and just the way that these things are put together. So you know, I, I'm I'm a I know I'm not a technical person, and so therefore I'm probably over-impressed by the way that technology can really help. By the time Series 7 goes out, technology will have advanced during the yeah, my, yeah, making yeah. time of, of the entire thing. Do you think you'll ever look back on the first one and think, I wish we'd had the technology that we had when we did the last? Yeah, even now a bit, yeah. I mean, you look at some of the, the effects and you think, well, it's much better now. Um, once you've got over how young everybody looks already, in the first ones. I think they had the same problem with Harry Potter. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, uh, Peter Morgan, who wrote The Crown, has talked of the rise of episodic being much better for writers than feature length. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you, it's sort of cheating if, if you're doing episodic because you can keep putting these cliffhangers in. And it's like, you know, you can't really do that if there's no gap after what you did. Like, if you're writing a, a two-hour film, you can't keep doing that. Um, and I think episodic used to, be a, it used to be a dirty word. You know, it feels a bit episodic. But now, I mean, people... Have, and, and that's why I really love Dickens, is that he wrote episodic stuff. He used to write a bit, and then people would wait until the magazine came out, and then they'd get the next bit. So I think it's great. And, and it, it's really suited to, um, to television, because, as I say, people then get together and talk about what they think may happen next. It's interesting, you, you mentioned that, um, that you can't see an end to schedule broadcasts for the very simple no, reason no, no, that definitely. people get together and, yeah. and talk about it. However, uh, an awful lot of people watch things on demand, mm. and certainly in terms of the things that I watch are usually because somebody that I know has given me a nudge, mm. and I'll go and catch up to where they yeah. are. Yeah. So in, in fact, you're still getting that um, kind of following day debrief, mm. but with people in a close circle to you rather yeah. than right across a, a population. But then I think uh, with social media as well, you get in these little villages of people of, of common interest. So, you know, the Peaky fans on, on social media are very vocal and, and that's all good. But I think there is something about not sitting down and doing the whole thing seeing the whole thing from beginning to end. A lot of people do it, and a lot of people love it, and a lot of people say, I wouldn't watch anything. Some people wait so that they can watch the whole thing in one go. But I think the buzz comes is probably coming more likely from that initial, no one else has ever seen this before, and I've just found out what happened. Yeah, I, I, I can see your point of view. I think... I've been very late to the whole idea of box sets and mm. binge watching things mm. because I've never had the time to do it. Yeah, yeah. I think I might have done it once in my life and then mm. thought, well, this is quite extraordinary. You mm. know, I don't have to wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think today's generation are naturally quite impatient. Mm. Um, and this whole idea of I've worked Monday to Friday, I'm mm. going to spend Saturday on the couch mm. and, and just watch this start to mm. finish um, is something that's going to increase in popularity. Yeah, I mean, the conversations I'm hearing over there are increasingly, we want to harness the power of people seeing it all at the same time. They've sort of gone around in a big circle and they're starting to come back to that idea that there is something about, you hook people with that, where people say, I saw this last night, and two people saw it, and three people saw it last night at the same time, and they call each other, then they get onto, the, um, onto social media and talk about what happened because it happened at a particular time, at a particular day. So maybe something that was old-fashioned is coming back. When you spoke about uh, shooting the Peaky Blinders thus far, uh, locations used in, in Liverpool um, and parts of Manchester, Leeds, Bradford, um, because of the housing stock, because of the yeah, yeah. places they've got. Going forwards, would you always prefer to use real location rather than CGI? 
Oh yeah, I mean it's just cheaper. I mean, it, it's really it, it's difficult to you know it, it, the, the the expression which is now banned in a lot of film sets and I've, I've just directed something where nobody's allowed to say we'll fix it in post which is like everybody just goes, it's fine we'll fix it in post and it's just not that simple you know and and you can't really go through the whole process with that in mind thinking that you're going to be bailed out by technology you I mean often you are but I think as long as you planned to be bailed out by technology and not just assume it can do everything um, and there's nothing like the real thing, you know, there's nothing like the real solid bricks and mortar. But, um, you know, if you see the difference between Watery Lane and Peaky Blinders before CGI and after, it's huge because you put great, you put add stuff to it in the distance. But I think as long as you're doing that, it's okay. But if the doors slam and the bricks are real, then that's really important. More important than authenticity to time. Yeah, I mean, if, if you, as long as you're you're walking in and out of a Victorian house, you're fine in the twenties. You know what I mean? Because it, it, it would have been there. So, and there are very very talented people who make sure that everything is spot on in terms of time. Now, I want you to think very carefully about uh, the answer to this one. Who would win in a straight fight between Alfie Solomon and Chris Tarrant? Chris Tarrant. Chris Tarrant. <laughs> <laughs> Was he a nice man to work with? He's brilliant. He's big as well. He's a big bloke. Is um, he? Yeah, but he's no, he's great. He's a real laugh, and you know, he's really likable person. But there's no edge to him. Really. You must have worked with a lot of celebrities over the years. Which ones stick in your memory as as being real characters? Yeah, I mean, the, Tom's a real character, obviously, um, and you know, you get good and bad, but largely good. And I think that. In my experience, that uh, we some often create our own monsters, where people are treated in such a way as if that's you know Oriental royalty. You know, everything they want is given to them. Of course, they become difficult, you know, because then I've found that you can normal people to death. You know, you can just surround them with normality. Everything is normal. Nothing. No one's going to treat you in a different way. You're just going to be treated like a normal person. Then, I think they become much more, um, you know, collegiate, because sometimes people arrive. Usually, they're a little bit scared, and they start to throw their weight around, and you know that can spiral out of control. Now, I did know that talking about the new studio was going to spark the interest of many of the people here tonight. Uh, a question says, um, "We're seeing computer games getting more like movies." Mm -hmm. Would you be prepared to write for games, or do you see the computer games publishers getting involved in your studio at all? Yeah, that's what I want. I mean, I want this to be a place where everything is done. And if, it, if it's a moving image, then it belongs in our... And would limited. you write for computer games? I've been asked to do it, and, and I said I would look at it. And then the only reason I didn't was because the, when we had the meeting, it was very... Um, there was a lot of sort of... Rule, not rules, but that they were very certain about what could and couldn't happen. Um, and what I find really interesting, and I'd, I'd love to spend time trying to find ways to do this, but all of the options that you get, so that when the player chooses that, then you're opening up that more options and more options and more options. And what can happen is that, therefore, the quality of each option goes down because it's so much, it's so much work, you know, because you've got to offer people options. But my kids, uh, you know, I watch them over their shoulders. They, and people say young people have got no attention span. They have when they're playing that. They're on and they're in it. And I think there is a difference between the suspension of disbelief when someone's watching a film or a television programme. I think it's more profound, actually, when they're playing a game. I think they've gone further in and they are really part of it. And, you know, you see the way they're moving and the way they're in the... And, I think it's really interesting. I, I don't think it's a destructive thing at all necessarily. I think it can be. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, you watch, uh, I watch some of them and I think this is awful. Um, you know, there's, there's no story here. It's just people beating people up. But potentially, you know, what was that one where someone created all those worlds? Um, no Man's Sky and things like that. It just suggests that there is room for someone creatively to to make something that is the next level beyond even film and television. I really do. But the graphics now are so good that if my son's playing FIFA, I only know if he's playing the game when he's got the control oh, yeah. in his hand. Absolutely. Otherwise, I think it's yeah, a football match. Exactly. Um, you say that Peaky Blinders sat in your bottom drawer for a long time. Um, 
and eventually saw the light of day and obviously has been massively well received. Have you got any other wonderful ideas smouldering away somewhere? Oh, hopefully, yeah. Um, hopefully things, things come. I mean, things just come, you know, through, just through daily life and, and you, you see something or hear something and usually something that's actually happened to someone. And then you try and do what you can to mythologise it, fictionalise it, make it entertaining. And does Steve Knight have any spare time? To watch, I mean, it's either Sky Sports or writing, basically. So I watch a lot of sport. Holidays, travel, hobbies? Normally driven by something that I'm doing. Like Usually it's a project I'm working on will take me to somewhere and I'll, we'll all go and we'll enjoy it there. Steve, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you Steve Nye. Please put your hands together. I hope that uh, we've managed to answer most of your questions in the course of the interview today. I don't think there's much about you that we don't know anymore. Can I just wish you all the best for your Thank studio you. and for the future and, of course, for the other series of Peaky Blinders. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you.